Hey, uh, this evening it's a pleasure to have with us Annie Heiser. Uh, Annie is with the uh, Community Food Agricultural Coalition, CFACT for short. Uh, CFACT has been uh, very active in the Missoula, in Missoula County uh, in terms of um, promoting agriculture uh, and various types of small farm food programs. So uh, I'd like to take this opportunity, opportunity to introduce Annie and she'll talk to us about uh, uh, seeing the talk, uh, see that from the program. Thanks. All right. I guess, Willis, I might come over on this side. Is that okay? I'm on this side of the table? Okay. All right. How are y'all doing tonight? Pretty good. Good. All right. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, again, my name is Annie Heiser. I work for the Community Food and Agriculture Coalition. And um, thanks to Willis and to Pam, who um, helped get me here. Um, let's see which way this system works best. And again, I work for the Community Food and Agriculture Coalition, and I'll have my info on the last slide too in case you'd like to take it down. But I wanted to start out with just um, a little bit of a conversation about what the food system is and all of the parts that make it up because like any complex system, the food system has a lot of different players, it has a lot of different pieces and so there are a lot of different ways in which we can impact the food system and places where we can ask for change and push for change. <coughs> so. Uh, and all of these different pieces have their own set of issues, and they all are also cross-cutting issues that, that interrelate them all. So to start out with, we have inputs. And can you guys, is this, a, can you see that all right? Okay. Um, so, you know, inputs comprise everything from seeds to fertilizers, pesticides, all the way down to the sun and the dirt. Um, and so every, all of these, places again have different things that we can change and one of the things that we think about a lot is the land um, and so I'll talk about that a little bit later but really key starting point then of course we have the growers the people that grow our food both from the farm workers that work on farms in <clears throat> in other parts of this state not as much in this state mostly we have farmer owners in this part of the state but the people who grow the land is another really interesting area Montana's average age for farmers is 59 years old. So that's a big uh, change coming up and it's a big opportunity. So definitely a place for, um, <clears throat> a place to push for change. And then we have packing and I'm gonna kind of link packing and food processing together here. Transporting and retailing. And these three parts of the food system I think are really interesting. It's kind of the hidden scene. Um, and there's a lot going on here and there's a lot that's changed. So I'm going to delve into these a little bit more before getting to eating and disposing. But it's this kind of middle part that gets us from a raw food product that comes out of the field to our table. And <clears throat> This is the area, I would say, where agriculture has changed the most over the last 50 years in this country. There are two big things that have been happening that have made our food system much more consolidated. One is horizontal integration. And horizontal integration means that each business occupies a much larger market share. So in beef packing, for instance, so the packaging and processing of beef in America, 84% of the beef that's packaged in America is done by just four firms. So when we think about you know, <clears throat> market share becoming, getting to such a point where there's unfair, there's a lack of competition um, because there's, so, there's such a large market share being held by one or two companies, much of the foods industry is like this. Beef packing is not alone. It's happening in poultry, it's happening in eggs, it's happening in pigs, it's happening in all of these different areas where there's just companies that occupy a much larger market share. And then there's also vertical integration, which means that there's a lot more pieces of the chain that are being done by one individual company. <coughs> 
So an example of this is ConAgra. ConAgra is a large um, agribusiness that is involved in uh, many different areas of the food system. So ConAgra, um, I have to keep on my notes here. So to start, ConAgra distributes seed, fertilizers, and pesticides. So they have a big role in the input industry. They also own and manage grain elevators, barges, and train, and, and they uh, run train, uh, they have railroad cars. So right there you can see that the farmer is in between these two parts that are both owned by the same person. So the opportunities for the farmer to get squeezed and the margins on the farm to get narrower and narrower are really clear here because ConAgra has the ability both to say, this is how much I'm going to charge you for the things that you have to buy to make your farm run, and I'm going to decide how much I'm going to pay you for the grains that come off your farm. So they're owning both sides of that process. But they also then manufacture the feed that they buy into the grain that they buy into animal feed, and they own chicken um, growing facilities and processing facilities. So they're actually vertically integrated in two different industries. So they have a large portion of the grain industry from the bottom to the top, and they have a large portion of the poultry industry from the bottom to the top. And then of course, they're horizontally integrated. So within the poultry industry, for example, they hold a large market share. So what this means is that the ability of the farmer to make a large share of the food dollar that we spend and the ability for uh, that, that dollar to be, to be uh, utilized by a larger number of people is, is very limited. They have a lar they, they're owning all parts of this food chain. And um, there's one other thing I wanted to say about that. Oh, well, obviously, this is smart from ConAgra's perspective, right? I mean, what a better way to reduce your costs than to own all the cost-making parts. But for us, for everybody else in the system, it, it can be very limiting. But here's an example of a different kind of integration. The Western Montana Growers Cooperative is a cooperative based here in Western Montana, as you might expect. And they are a farmer-run cooperative. So they, uh, they're still integrated, but they're doing it in a way that has a lot bigger benefits in different areas of our community. So independent growers own the cooperative. So they're growing the produce and then they're selling it to the cooperative. So there's a, they're getting a higher percentage of the dollar right there. Then the growers co-op um, does the processing and the packing. So they have two different kinds of outputs. They do um, kind of advanced processing. So they will buy things like, say, butternut squash from some of their farmer members. And they will take it to the Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center, which is in Ronan. It's a community commercial kitchen in Ronan. And they'll process it into frozen butternut squash chunks that they can sell to the University of Montana and other major institutions. They also have a CSA, which is a community supported agriculture. Anybody not heard of a CSA? OK, great. So a CSA is. Um, a way for a, a farmer would sell you a share. So if you're starting out at the beginning of the season, you may buy a share in the, in the farm in March or April. Let's say you pay $400. For that $400, you are going to get a box of vegetables or a box of fruit or cheese or milk or whatever kind of CSA share it is throughout the season, every week or every two weeks. So you get the benefit of having uh, pretty cheap vegetables when you look at it over the whole season, they have the benefit of getting a bulk amount of money when they need it most, when they're buying seeds and other inputs and other things to help get started in the beginning of the season. So it's kind of a way to share the costs. So the growers co-op processes and packages food for the university and for the institutions. They also pack food for their own CSA. And then they distribute in partnership with Charlie's Produce and some of their, some other, um, folks that are moving food around the region. And they um, distribute to grocery stores, to retail outlets, to restaurants, and to all their CSA members. So again, this is a situation where the Western Montana Growers Co-op is sort of integrating some of those pieces. But they're doing it in a way where the growers own it at every level. So there's more profit to the farmer at each level. 
And then it cycles back through all of these parts. I'm sure many of you have heard about the benefit of um, buying local and that so much more, per, so much larger proportion of our dollar goes back into our community when we buy things from an independent local producer. So the Western Montana Growers Co-op is really able to capitalize on that and make big gains for our, our local economy. So that kind of gets us through some examples of this part of the food system. So we've gotten through the growing, the packing, and the processing, the uh, transporting, and the retailing. So the next major part is eating, the consumers. And the big thing that we think about here when we think about places for change in the food system is around hunger and food security and food access. So asking, you know, not only asking is, are we growing enough food, but are we growing high quality nutritious food and is it available and accessible to everyone? So not only is it accessible to them physically, like at their local neighborhood grocery store, but also is it available at a price that they can afford to pay? And then the last one we get to is disposal. America has a big problem with food waste. There are estimates that we waste over almost 40% of the food that we grow. Um, and that's, you know, not just coming from, you know, we're not just eating two thirds of our plate of food. It's coming from waste from grocery stores, from waste from restaurants, from all across the, these, these pieces of the <clears throat> food system. So that's a big issue. But there's also an opportunity there because some of that food, while a lot of that food right now is going to landfills, a lot of it could be being composted and becoming another input into the food system as great soil. So <clears throat> all of these different areas, when we look at this larger picture, I hope that these seven little dots kind of look a lot more complicated now. <laughs> um, before I go into what we do, are there any questions for me about that? Yeah. Is that 40% figure, 40% waste that is kind of high, well it seems high, it certainly seems high, uh, but we're talking about perishable items here and I'm wondering what the realistic number is for a, a waste factor if we were to improve everything that we could as much as we could. Do yeah. you have a number there? No, I don't. I mean, I know that like, I, I, you may have heard of uh, New York City decided that they were going to require that people start composting um, recently and that was definitely an effort to try and reduce the amount of food waste because obviously there's there's going to be some you know food packaging and other things that we're not going to be able to compost some kinds of meats and things we aren't supposed to compost um, or are harder to compost but um, 40 to 50 percent is is a pretty standard rate. So I mean when if you think about all of the things that the grocery store has to dump that they that wind up in the dumpster from the produce aisles, you know, wilted cilantro comes to mind. <laughs> about the things in the grocery stores because I used to work in one. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, we're talking <clears throat> the consumer behavior of course is the major factor in the store for uh, creating waste. Obviously, you present what you have to them, uh, hoping they'll purchase it. But there are things through the um, factors of time and, and aging of the product that they just aren't going to sell. And you cannot walk out onto the floor of your retail establishment and tell them, you can't buy that one, you have to buy this one. Yeah. So, well, it's, so one of those, you know, consumer behavior. Yeah might be some area where there could be some improvement. I don't know if that's been considered. Well, and I think definitely one of the things that some groups work on very extensively, for example, is seasonality. So trying to get people to understand that uh, it's really hard for a grocery store to keep things fresh if they're not in season. And, and that if you go to the, we all have this expectation that we can go to the grocery store any time of year and get grapefruit. But grapefruit is something that only grows certain times a year, as are all the things that grow that are that we have in the grocery store that are that are fresh. So you know a lot of those those kinds of things. And there's even the if I may follow up now, it's getting to the point where we a lot of folks expect they can go to the grocery store any time of the day. 
Whereas it used to be a nine o'clock, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. business when folks were in work mode and shopping mode and if you didn't get it then, you didn't get it until the next day. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But the extension, the point is the extension of hours also introduces more possibility for, for spoilage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you know what percentage is waste, wasted by the consumer? Because from my experience, consumers waste a lot. They don't, a lot of people don't want to eat leftovers. They, they throw away a lot off their dish. They, yeah. You know, I, if it wasn't so cheap, yeah. I think people wouldn't um, throw away as much. I don't. The main, there was, there were, there was a guy who did research on food waste over about 10 year period and he put a, a report in 2004 that's kind of the main one that a lot of people cite back to and I'm sure that that has it but I, I don't know but I could definitely find out for you. Does CFAC help with any of the, um, maybe I'm not sure it's called repurposing or uh, diverting produce and things that are expired to homeless shelters and food banks and things like that? Um, no, we don't. We you know, food access and sort of that piece of it um, and working closer with the food banks is something that we did in the past and our mission sort of shifts based on what other groups are operating in the food system and what needs the most energy put towards it at any time. And the food, um, the food security piece like Garden City Harvest does a lot on food security and, and that kind of piece of it. And then the food banks obviously do a tremendous job of doing that. So we've sort of backed out of that realm a little bit. But that, uh, what I was trying to get to was there's restaurants and grocery stores that have blemished food mm -hmm. that is just fine for consumption. So it could be sent to the pop -Rell. So are you, you're not involved with that anymore, it's more the, the, the organizations that do it themselves? Yeah, and I think that the food bank does do some of that, yeah. Uh, do you know how many farms operate in Montana that are have CSA programs? Mm, no, I don't. Uh, there, I know that there are about uh, 11 different farms that offered a CSA last year in the Missoula County. If you're a resident of Missoula, they were doing drops in Missoula or whatnot. Um, but across the state, I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that. I don't think that anybody's counting that number. What do you think is outlines for acquiring consumers in the CDC? How do contact consumers? I've never heard of them. Yeah. I mean, to a certain extent, I think that that, that that represents a market that has a lot of room to grow because of that very reason. A lot of the people that are finding, that are that have CSAs, a lot of the farms that offer CSAs right now are, are finding most of their clients through um, farmers market stand that they run and they just also have a pamphlet that talks about their CSA that you can join or they might have a Facebook page that they're marketing through, but the marketing can be pretty limited on it right now. Um, I mean, I think that the Growers Co-op CSA has something like 150 members in it. So it's, it's a lot of produce that's um, funneling through that method. And, there, and then there are, you know, 10 or 11 other farms doing that same kind of method, so. I mean, I have a religious, kind of dislike for acronyms. And what does CSA stand for? Sorry, I should have said that. It's Community Supported Agriculture. So that kind of gets back to that idea that it's, uh, that the community is sharing both in, in helping the farmer to get started at the beginning of the season and at the same time, you don't get a refund if the farmer gets a hailstorm. So you're also bearing some of the risk of the farmer and so it's, it's also sort of a way to spread that way. Uh, is there a, I think that's what the question was. If there's no coordinated list what's available in the and what's available for people in this area. Yeah, we have a list um, on our website. And, and one that I can share with you of CSAs that are available. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, in terms of the seasonal model, I mean, like we have food, uh, farmers markets here, do great in the summer. Um, you know, uh, the share programs do that. Is there a kind of a, a bi local version of the, the litter issue? I mean, we used to store stuff or can our own stuff, and, but that doesn't happen. So what is the next best solution to that? To eating local in the wintertime? Yeah. <laughs> um, so there are a couple of different 
things that I think um, can help get us along a little ways anyway. Um, for what's available right now, there are some farms that do winter CSA shares. So through the fall, they'll sell you potatoes, onions, carrots, apples, other kinds of root crops that'll stay good for a long time so that you can put them in a cool, dark place in your house and eat them. I mean, we're still eating potatoes and onions that we pulled out of the ground back in, I don't know, September. So that's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, we have them under our stairs. So <laughs> it doesn't have to be super fancy. Um, but then, you know, canning and, and processing, freezing, we froze a lot of produce. That's one way. One thing that is a big thing in local food is that we have moved, because we have such a fresh food availability at the grocery stores, we've really moved away from having the taste of frozen food and being used to using frozen food and knowing ways to use, them, use it well. So, um, you know, frozen food is a big piece of eating local in the winter to me anyway um, so um, but then you know there's a lot of season extension that we could do that farmers aren't really tapping into right now if they were using greenhouses and doing a lot more of that we could be eating spinach and lettuce and and kale all through the winter here too probably not tomatoes but some things some of the hardier things we could be eating all through the winter so so yeah so those things are more accessible um, or could be more accessible we hope so um, but I'll jump into what we're doing. So to, to create change, we have three major kind of program areas that we work on at the Community Food and Agriculture Coalition. We work on saving farmland, growing farmers, and then we also have a bunch of different projects that we do to kind of connect the dots. Um, so saving farmland is something that we've been working on pretty much the entire time that we've been in existence. And um, Losing Ground is a report that we put out in 2010 to, to go over this idea and, and provide some ideas on how to um, move forward here. But, um, you know, a lot of our thoughts on conserving farmland revolve around the fact, our perception that there are a lot of great organizations in Missoula that are conserving farmland through incentives. So we have land trusts, um, we have the open space bond, other things like that that are purchasing people's development rights or paying people to keep their farmland in farmland. But our sense is that that process is too slow, it takes too much money to get the kind of benefits that we want to see, and the development pressure is too high. There are a lot of people who the county has gone to and said, we will pay you if you will not develop your property. And they say no. So they say, I know I can get more money if I develop. So this is a, you know, it's a reasonable uh, thing for people to feel, but it also is something that is a real concern to us as we look into the future, particularly when we think about climate change. I'm not from, sure how many of you are familiar with this report. This is um, the climate change primer that came out of the Climate Wise workshops that were done a few years ago by the Clark Fork Coalition and the Geos Institute and um, Headwaters Economics. And one of the big things that they found was that our region is actually expected from a agriculture and a kind of human comfort level, we're expected to be a lot more comfortable than a lot of other parts of the country. So um, it's, uh, <clears throat> so in terms of sort of thinking about what that means for us over the next 20 to 30 years, we can expect to see a lot more people moving into our area at the same time as our agricultural land is going to be worth a lot more because um, in comparison to other areas of the country like the lower Midwest where it's a huge agricultural production area, they're gonna be having a lot harder time producing at the same level they're producing. And so the pressure is gonna be on us to produce food and to house all of these people who are moving here. So really, <clears throat> you know, climate change really makes saving farmland all the more important right now. So <clears throat> for those reasons, we've focused on a couple of different tactics to preserve farmland. Um, one is through subdivision review, and we, um, for the last six years, have been an agency in the subdivision review process, so we review every subdivision that happens on agricultural land um, in the county. And we also have really been pushing the county to develop some policies to think proactively about 
conserving farmland and about what we think about agriculture in our future. And I'm really excited to say that this year there are three different major pieces that will be being worked on at the county level um, that provide a lot of opportunity for thinking about farmland and thinking about our future. The county is right now in the process of finalizing an update to chapter two of the growth policy, which is the county profile. So it has, um, it's, it doesn't have like the policies and the, the plan for the future, but what it does is it documents what's happening right now and what the trends are. And so it provide, really sets the tone for the rest of the growth policy, which is a really important document. They're doing chapter two and then they're gonna kind of set that aside for a year while they work on revising the subdivision regulations and the zoning regulations, both of which are going to have a huge impact on the way that our community looks, feels, the way we, uh, where we live and, and how we're transported around our community and then over the next 50 years. So all of these processes have a lot of opportunity for community um, advocacy and engagement and a lot of opportunities for preserving farmland. So that's kind of the end of the farmland piece there. And maybe I'll just move along and we can talk about questions afterwards. So another thing that we're working on um, is growing farmers and growing opportunities for a new generation of farmers and preparing them to be as successful as possible. So like I mentioned earlier, the average age of farmers in Montana is now 59 years old. And so many are older than that. And um, this is a trend that is the same across the country. Across the country, this person is not 59, in case I... <laughs> um, across the country, the vast majority of agricultural land is expected to transfer hands over the next 20 years. So that can be a really scary thing or it can be a great opportunity for us depending on how we look at it. And I think that it's really exciting because in Missoula, in Western Montana and across the country, there is a large generation of people who are excited to farm. And, um, and many of them are farming differently and taking a little bit different approach that may make them more viable as we move forward. Um, they're raising livestock on grass instead of on corn. They're raising crops with an eye towards um, seeds that have been around for a really long time, an eye towards taste um, instead of towards shelf life. Um, and they're building community and they're bringing jobs into areas of our state that haven't seen new industry in a long time. So this is a really, um, exciting opportunity to watch this generation come about and to help them get started. So how can we help them? Um, they need land. So we have a program called LandLink that helps to connect farmers with um, available land in the area. So it's, um, it's an online database that lists uh, land belonging to people who are either retiring farmers or non-agricultural landowners who have land that could be farmed but it isn't being farmed right now. We can help them through education, um, through uh, helping them learn about strategic planning and business planning and evaluating different economic options. We can help them through accessing better financing. Um, financing a farm is very challenging to do. It's very risky business. Um, but there are quite a few programs offered at the federal and state level for beginning farmers, and they're not being used. There was a national study of, of programs by the Farm Service Agency and the Natural Resources Conservation Service recently, which are two major federal funders. And it found that Montana is one of the states that has the lowest usage of farm funding programs. So really there's an opportunity there that we're not accessing. Networking is a really important piece. Um, a lot of people in this uh, new generation of farmers didn't grow up on a farm and didn't get a formal education in agriculture. So they don't have somebody who they can call and say, how did you get into that market? How did you afford to buy a tractor? Uh, how did you deal with this pest or, you know, with a frost, an early frost or a late frost? How did you deal with all of these things? So helping them to build a network here in Western Montana will help them to be more resilient and help them to deal with the challenges that they'll face. And then finally, helping them to figure out markets. In Missoula County, we have great farmers markets. They're really fun to go to from a consumer perspective. But what we're hearing back is that they're not really a great place to sell produce. Um, 
they, you, uh, most of the farmers that sell at the farmer's market don't sell out of their produce every day. And they're there in large part as a way to market their farm and market their CSA program or market other pieces of what they do. Um, because they're not selling all of their produce at the farmer's market like you might expect them to. So when a new farmer comes in, how do we help them to learn about the market opportunities that really are viable and help them to get an operation going that can really be successful? So we have two courses that we're offering. They're actually starting this week for farmers. The Planning for On-Farm Success workshop series is designed for beginning farmers to help them get on their feet and get going. And the Multifunctional Farming course is designed towards established farmers who are looking to add value to their farm in some way. So whether it's taking some of their product and making pickles so they can sell it for more money down the road, or whether it's adding a small studio that they can rent to vacationers, adding a farm stand, any number of things that they can do to make their farm more profitable. So we're both trying to help new people get started and trying to help established farmers stay on the land, which also in a way is a farmland conservation strategy. So all of these pieces link back together. And then finally, um, we have our work helping to connect the dots. And so the Montana Food Economy Initiative is a project that we put together with the Mission Mountain Food Enterprise Center up in Ronan. And they, um, through this project, we're trying to bring together the people who are growing inputs, so people who are growing seeds, farmers, processors, packagers, distributors, all of those pieces of the food chain that we looked at early on, to see if by getting them all in the same room, we can help figure out some of the, um, some solutions to some of the cross-cutting issues that we see. So helping distributors connect with the retailers and helping growers connect with the, pr with the processors to help and build those relationships and solve, create some innovative solutions. We also have um, a Choose Local program that we're doing with the same organization up in Ronan. This is a grocery store oriented campaign. So one thing that I think is always kind of surprising about Western Montana is that there's, like I said, that we have these great farmers markets. But when you go to restaurants and when you go to grocery stores, a lot of times you don't see any local food. And certainly if you do see local food, maybe it's from the Northwest and it's not from Montana. So um, in part, that's an issue because of the way that a lot of major retailers operate nowadays. If I wanted to sell something to Safeway, I can bring my product to their grocery store, but nine times out of 10, they're gonna have to ship it to Spokane to get redistributed and get sent back to, to here to Missoula. So the, the ability to have that kind of, the you know uh, climate benefits or carbon benefits or food miles benefits of buying local are significantly reduced when our apples are traveling from here to uh, Spokane and back instead of just from the Bitterroot to here. Um, but also because in grocery stores and in um, restaurants, a lot of times what I found was that they are selling some things that are local and they're just not marketing it very effectively. Um, Sean Kelly's I think is a great example. Sean Kelly sells a bunch of local food on their menu, but they don't, I, I have no way of knowing that. The Bagels on Broadway uses all local sprouts that they buy from a, from a farmer here in the valley. You'd never know that. So helping people to market that they're doing this so that we can ask for it more when we go to the store and when we go to the restaurant. So uh, that's it. Um, I welcome you to join us. Um, you can join CFAG as a member. You can help us to work on any of these projects. All, um, we have a number of different committees that really drive these projects. CFAG is a two-person organization. And so for us to get all of this done, most of the work happens at the committee level. They help to develop our projects, drive our projects, um, and help us get it done. And if you'd like to help us get the word out to more folks about what we're doing, you can host a house party or any number of things. So. Welcome you to join us. Any questions? Thank you. Um, did you do you have a handout with the contact information, your website, and that sort of thing? No. With you? Do you uh, so, <laughs> what's the website? At? Um, this is the website address. It's MissoulaCFAC.org. But I also do have a sign-up sheet here that I'll put on the desk outside. So, if and you want to. That website does it have information about um, the list of growers and what they grow? Yeah, so 
Yeah, so there are two kind of sections of our website. There's a part that's called Good Food Issues that has info about all of these different pieces of the food system that I talked about. And then there's a part that says Our Initiatives and that, that has information about all the projects that we do. And um, so where would the, the, uh, the training, is it free? Whatever nope. training you offer? So the training that we're doing right now for beginning farmers, it's um, $100 for the four workshops and it comes with lunch and, and assistance in between the workshops. And last question, do you um, do anything to try to prevent or encourage farmers not to use GMO seeds? Um, we don't currently have any campaigns um, around GMOs. It's kind of, it's something that we've discussed a lot and um, I'm not personally a big fan of GMOs, but I know that there are some people that have kind of a mixed opinion of them and aren't necessarily completely against them. So we've, we've, we're, we're still working on developing our platform around that, I would say. And I'd be happy to talk more about that after or right now, whenever. Yeah. <coughs> Going back to the where you were talking about um, the growth policies and mm -hmm. how you're involved with that, do you encourage any you know, subdivisions and things like that that are maybe going to consume some farmland? Do you add in any component for uh, like community gardens or you know neighborhood gardens or things like that? Yeah. So depending on the subdivision and where it is, what we'll propose and how we propose that they kind of address any impact on agriculture will be different. So um, there definitely have been ones that have been kind of closer to town or a little higher density where we've said, make the lots a little bit smaller and then give everybody a community garden parcel or make a community garden so there's shared open space. And that can be a great fit in some subdivisions. In other subdivisions, um, where it's been like a really large chunk of really great agricultural land, we've advocated that they design the subdivision in a way that you put the lots over here and then you preserve this area over here. So that, you know, maybe you can even, sometimes you can even add more lots um, because you're preserving an area on the other, kind of on the other side where the, where the best ag land is. So a lot of different kinds of options. But yeah, community gardens, definitely something that we think about. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering how, what's the basic investment that most people put in, new farmers put in, uh, both monetarily and how much, like what's, how much land do you need for money? That's a great question. Um, so you hear a range of things and it really depends on what people want to do, especially on the acreage. So. I've heard people say that for a small, say, vegetable operation, that you can get started with just a few thousand dollars. Depends on what, you, what the constraints are of the land that you buy. Obviously, if you get access to land that has big deer fencing all the way around it, then your costs are a lot lower because deer fencing can be pretty expensive. Um, but then like livestock, you know, to have a viable, you know, a lot of what we used to see for agriculture was like a cow-calf operation where you're raising, you have, the mama cow, you have the mama cows and you're breeding them and you're raising the calves and you're selling them in October. And then you're keeping the mamas and rebreeding them and raising the calves and selling them in October. That kind of operation into the commodity food market, the kind of food that you see in the grocery store, you have to have a lot of land because the margins are so much smaller on each cow that you're selling. So, um, you know, Having less than 100 acres would probably be pretty tough if you're growing your feed and, and raising your cattle. But if you're selling into a local market and so you're getting a high, higher amount of, of, you're getting a higher price per cow, then, you know, I've heard of people starting on 40 acres or less, but it's a real range. It really depends. And then vegetable gardens, I've heard of people starting vegetable gardens that are a quarter acre and doing pretty well. So it really, you can have quite a range of, of acreage. Are there any, you were saying you aren't working on the greenhouse at all. So if you want to start up, that's one way of getting a big kick kind of land that no one else has. And you don't have to put the fences up, you don't have to do all sorts of stuff. Yeah, definitely. And people, right? Yeah. yeah. And greenhouses are something too where there's been a lot of research in the last, you know, five years or ten years too on how you can extend the season and how you can build your greenhouse in different ways to get a lot of extra heat and sunlight out of it. So, yeah, definitely. 
Um, one of the things that uh, I've been noticing, speaking of local food, it's kind of like um, organic food when it started. Um, some of the chains would say, oh, this is natural food instead of organic food, trying to you know, market it as organic. Well, now you see Safeway saying, we have local food. They mean local in the Western Hemisphere. You know, I mean, it's really ridiculous. I don't know how you, you know, at what level, and, and, and do you have any suggestions of how we can regulate that, and what, what kind of legislation needs to be passed to try and regulate that local? Yeah. Um, I think local is a tough phrase for a lot of reasons. That's one of them. Um, you know, there, and, and people have looked at it different ways. Some people are very specific about what local means, and they'll say it's only within 100 miles. Well, that's really tough if we're living in western Montana. <laughs> it's a lot easier than if you're living in eastern Montana, but it's still pretty hard if you're living in western Montana to have a 100-mile diet. You know, I mean, that means that you're getting to Hamilton and you're almost out of range, you know. Uh, you're, o you're at least more than halfway out of your range. So, um, you know, the... Then there are people who say 500 miles is the range, and then you know there are people that say the Pacific Northwest is the range. The University of Montana, their uh, definition of local is anything that's inside the state of Montana. So they can buy something from Haver, but they can't buy something from Salmon. So you know, it's, it's hard to draw a line, and there's been a lot of discussion in, in the whole food movement in general about how to draw that line, because there isn't really a really successful answer yet, unfortunately. Yeah, it's kind of self-defined. Discussion to get done. So it can be certified. And yeah. Well, and part of, you know, to me, part of the answer is that, and, and I don't know, maybe this is not the right answer, but part of the answer to me is that there isn't really any way to figure it out unless you just do a little bit of research. Like when you go to Safeway and they say local and then you turn it over and it says Spokane, then you can decide whether or not that means local to you. Because they're going to define it however they want to define it. <laughs> and there isn't really any way of stopping that. And at the same, on the same page, just because something's local, doesn't necessarily mean that it agrees with any of the other purchasing things that you may want. You know, I mean, there could be a local grower who is, or a local milk producer who's really not nice to their cattle, or really not nice to their employees, or you know, what, whatever are you, are on your list of things. So it kind of gets to the point where you just have to do your own research and decide, make your own decisions, and be a more informed consumer like we have in every area of sustainability, I guess. Is there any way uh, that we could incentivize uh, someone that has, let's say, I, I know a lot of people that have like 30, you know, I you know that would buy like 30 acres, but yet you don't use five acres, so they don't have, so, so we actually can incentivize them to get that other 25 acres into a farmland, mm -hmm. uh, vegetables and whatever, you know, vegetables and fruits it wouldn't be good for cows, naturally, but good vegetables and fruits and things. Yeah, well, so a couple different things. It's not really an incentive, but that's one of the goals of the land link program is to make people who have land like that where they say, I'm only using five acres. I have one horse and the rest of the land isn't being used um, to get somebody on that land and farming it. Um, but if they wanted to divide that piece off and sell it, there are actually tax benefits for people who sell land to beginning farmers. So in the state of Montana for state, state tax. So that's one incentive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to make sure. Um, one thing I find, we've got a garden in my house I live at. And um, one thing, of course, that I find is like we had tomato plants. I think part of it's just planting fewer tomato plants, but we ended up with giant bags <laughs> um, and I think we tried a little bit of, you know, trading for other stuff, but is there any, like, organized, like, uh, social networking site or something where when you have a ton of, or Craigslist, when you have a ton of extra produce, and you can connect with someone else who has a ton of extra produce or meat from hunting or something yeah. like that? 
Um, there is in other places. There isn't here yet. Um, but it definitely is something that's being tested out in some places. Um, there are both ideas like that where um, either your everyday citizen could use it and where your farmer when they're at the end of the farmer's market and they still have a huge amount of peppers could post it online and say I'm selling these bulk but you got to buy them bulk you know I'll sell you 20 pounds of peppers but I'll give you a really good deal on them or whatever it is um, and then you can split it with five people if you want to but that's something that we've thought about trying to to, to make happen um, and then there was another way, way to do that, but now it slipped my mind. It would be a very hard thing for you to put something on your website where people could do that. It yeah. sound like rocket science. Yeah. So you could do it if you wanted to. Yeah. Could you make it one, um, well, have a, a meeting with everybody that it's going to be this time to make spaghetti sauce and have a whole bunch of tomatoes, mm -hmm. the peppers. All that stuff, and it's homemade, and then everybody goes home with several jars, mm -hmm. depending on how much they want to buy. Mm -hmm. and yeah. There you go, and then we can start doing that thing about. Yeah. And so people start freezing stuff. Yeah, and Extension has some courses that they offer at different times of the year ab about helping people learn how to preserve food. So it'd be a great thing to connect those two. Not to diminish what CFAC does, I'm a very big supporter, but I've had these conversations with you and essentially Garden City Harvest is the best partner for that, but just like you, they're a tiny shop. And, um, but this is something that with community support, that this sort of thing can happen. But probably the best partner organization in the, in the city, county is Garden City Harvest for the small, um, yeah. home garden issues, you know, because it's, it's a different than farmer. So, but my question was, do you have any suggestions since we're going into a new legislative session for some um, key issues that could be tweaked or worked on, whether or not it's laws on, um, I know that if you're a farmer or a home gardener, you can sell at farmer's markets without being, um, passing through all the hoops of ag, certain ag hoops, <laughs> but if you go to sell to a grocery store, yeah. you put you in a whole different thing, the same with making pickles. Yeah. You can't sell pickles unless you go through all of the health department hoops. Yeah. Is there anything that you guys are <coughs> looking at, and also the subdivision regulations, um, in the upcoming session that we might be able to um, hear about, there's some things that are being support? Definitely, yes. Um, I would, well, first I would just jump back to your first point and add that another organization that's really helpful at the kind of individual level is MUD, the Missoula Urban Demonstration Project, because, um, you know, they have like so many different kinds of tools and they're working with the co op to start a seed, um, seed saving group, and, and so a lot of different things for home gardeners there. On the policy level, there are two big things that we face every session, but particularly in the last session, one of them came up. One thing that we face in every session is land use and um, attacks, on, attacks on planning at the local level and um, zoning and, um, you know, kind of this push for really extreme property rights and a property rights agenda. That has a huge impact on the farmland piece, obviously. One bill that comes up, has come up the last two, maybe three sessions, is one that seeks to change the definition of agriculture in the Subdivision Review Act. So counties and cities are given the jurisdiction to review subdivisions. They decided in the 70s, subdivisions have impacts on us, right? So every city and county can review subdivisions based on a number of different criteria. The impact on local services, on water, on wildlife, on the natural environment. One of the things that they can review the impacts on is agriculture and agricultural water user facilities like ditches. So in Missoula County, we're trying to interpret that, um, we, we interpret that to mean a broader impact on agriculture. So when a subdivision happens on agricultural land, it impacts 
the ag properties around it. It impacts the ag properties down the road who are getting, having more cars drive past and um, more weeds coming off of their car in, in the ditches. And there's a lot of impacts beyond just the fence line. Um, but there's a very big push and has been in past uh, legislative sessions to limit that down to just the adjacent landowner. And it limits, it cuts out a lot of people who are interested especially when you talk about ditches that go through many, many, many people's properties to get to the farmer. Um, so that's one that's always a big issue for us. Um, but the other issue that came up last session that really we hadn't seen a whole lot of before was that push to have more um, items be saleable without having to go through big food safety hoops. And there have been a lot of complaints from farmers over the last five or 10 years about the way that food safety regulations are applied across the state. So the federal government has food safety regulations, the state has food safety regulations, and then each county is allowed to have food safety regulations. So in Montana, the person who will talk with you on your farm or at the farmer's market and will deal with you on food safety regulations is the county sanitarian. They're contracted by the Department of Health and Human Services. So the same person who's reviewing spas and massage parlors and restaurants is also reviewing your farm and your on-farm food safety. So there have been a lot of challenges with that because the county sanitarians have applied the rules differently in different counties because they kind of are a, a self-presiding agent. Um, and it's there, it's on their back to prove that food is safe in the county. So depending on how stringent they are, they can, they can apply the regulations very differently. So last year, there was a study bill that was approved to study uh, both the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Public Health and Human Services to see which one of these agencies is really the best home for reviewing food safety on farm. Um, they're in the process of, of going through that right now. They just had a hearing um, in Missoula and they're having hearings in Billings and Bozeman next week or later this week and next week um, to hear back from farmers what, what are the areas that are really challenging. So that's gonna come back in the next legislative session and they're gonna be making some decisions presumably about how to deal with food safety and that's gonna be a really big issue in terms of whether how, how they change. The food safety regulations are gonna go through a major overhaul. So finding a way to make sure that food safety, you know, anytime that we're creating regulations, it's very easy to make regulations that make sure that we don't have the problems that we don't want to have. It's very hard to have regulations that encourage the things that we do want to have. So that's what we're trying to get the Department of Ag and the Department of Public Health and Human Safety to think about. I think we're going to have to uh, call it right at this point. I hate to cut it off. Amy's been really doing a great job. You know, uh, she has been very, very kind and not taking a lot of credit for working out and defeating the bill that Matt Wilsondale put on the floor last year to remove this agricultural consideration in the subdivision review. Um, CFAC worked really, really hard. There's a lot of us here in this community who really took a lot of time and and had to twist uh, one of our uh, non-democratic legislators to uh, to you know get into our program about uh, keeping that criterion in the law. But and he did CFAC, not ultimately. He ultimately, did he not, went the wrong way. <laughs> but he seemed to have a really, really great job. And uh, you know, one thing we need to consider here from the school folks is that we have in Western Montana access to good, consistently clean water for our ag uh, program. There are very few places in the United States, and even in Montana, that have that capacity. Now, and that's one thing we really need to protect, along with the fact that here in Missoula County, we have, as defined by the Department of Agriculture, number one, a prime soils. And I think that's really where CFAC is working to try to protect uh, that ag land in, in Missoula County. I have to really give you folks a lot of credit for doing that. But again, thank you, Annie.